Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel Petaluma, and I'm Pastor Zach, and I'm so glad that you're joining us from wherever you're listening from. One of the core values for us as a Calvary Chapel is teaching through God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. So we hope that God's Word speaks to you today and ministers to you in a very personal way. Believe it or not, that is one of my favorite sounds in our church services. It's just you greeting each other, welcoming each other, making connections. It's so important that the body of Christ is connected. It sounds so simple, but a dismembered body is not a good thing. Like a body that's pulled into pieces and not connected doesn't function well. So it's good for us to be connected and to take advantage even of those little opportunities uh, like we just did. So I love that. My name's Zach, by the way. I have the privilege of pastoring here at Calvary Chapel Petaluma. If we haven't met yet, um, I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome. And uh, it is our mission here at Calvary Chapel Petaluma to be a church that's growing in our love for God and our love for people and to serve and reach the world. And so Um, As we gather and as we worship and as we open God's word, let's fix our attention on him. You know, so much of the rest of our week, our attention gets pulled in all of these directions. And of course, we wanna invite God into all those moments of our life and we can have confidence that he's with us. But this is a time that we set aside to say, God, our whole focus is just on you. And we don't do that enough, do we? And that's why this time I think is a gift because God knows all the responsibilities and things that we deal with throughout the week. And so he says, hey, set one day aside um, where, you, where you just devote your attention, your time, where, where you're not in a hurry in my presence. And we get to do that today. And so I'm gonna teach for three hours, so get ready. Please turn to Daniel 11. You think I'm kidding, but it won't be three hours, I promise. Don't run out, but um, we're in for something this morning. Daniel chapter 11 is where we'll be looking. We've been going through the book of Daniel. And the first thing that I read when I opened my commentary this week to study this chapter uh, was this quote by Herbert C. Leopold. I'm not exactly sure if that's how you say his name, but he says, this chapter, Daniel 11, might be treated in Bible classes, but we do not see how it could ever be used for a sermon or for sermons. (laughs) So I'm like, great, okay, so that's encouraging, but we're gonna attempt the impossible this morning and actually have a sermon on Daniel 11. I've entitled this sermon, God's Plan, on purpose because there is this song by an artist named Drake. He's a Canadian rapper. And he has this, not a Christian artist, he has this song that like has been listened to millions and zillions of times. So my hope is that when we post this on YouTube entitled God's Plan, someone looking for that song will just stumble on this teaching and maybe they'll hear God's word. Maybe they'll hear the gospel and God will use it. So I have this sinister plan with this message. Let's hope it's, let's hope it's good. Um, But if you don't know about Daniel 11, it's easy to get lost trying to follow the history, all these kings and battles and conspiracies that are described here. Um, So we're not going to read every word in the chapter. I'm going to try to kind of highlight, summarize, outline for you. We'll read big parts of it, but we're not going to read every word. I would encourage you, though, to read through the sections that we don't have time for this morning If we did read every word, it would be a three-hour sermon. So uh, you can thank me for that later. But if you want to do a a detailed, deeper dive into some scholars uh, that unpack the real-life history, it's fascinating. Uh, One resource that I would recommend, the Expositor's Bible Commentary by Frank E. Gableen, G-A-E-B-L, no, G-A-E-B-E-L-E-I-N. I'm not sure if I said that right either, but the Expositor's Bible Commentary, it it covers the whole Bible. It's several volumes, but you can look at Daniel, and the way that he unpacks the history is just absolutely 
mind-blowing. If you want something a little simpler or approachable, you could look at Warren Wiersbe's commentary. You could look at a great commentary by uh, John Corson, his Bible commentary. But basically, Daniel 11 is this bird's eye view prophetically of what is now to us history. And I want you to not forget that because we read it and we look back and we see how perfectly it's fulfilled in history. But some of us, we don't like history. How many of you love history? All right. (laughs) Yeah, okay. So you need to get that first commentary. I love it. Um, So a lot more of you than I thought love history. That's good. But not everybody loves, not everybody gets that excited about it. Um, And so, yeah, let's not forget, though, that what is to us history was for Daniel prophecy. It should just blow our minds that God would give in this kind of detail his plan and then unfold it in history just like he told Daniel. We can't forget that because from Daniel's perspective, he's hearing these things and he's like, he's probably just completely puzzled. And in fact, we know that when we read about him in in Daniel 10 and his response and he's just kind of overwhelmed and he's falling down and he's passing out and he can't catch his breath and he's just like, what does all of this mean? And for us, it's almost ironic that we're like bored with it. Like, oh yeah, that's history. Who cares? That's boring. No, God gave his plan to Daniel in advance in the most amazing way. In fact, some people have counted over 135 specific prophecies fulfilled in just this one chapter in the most amazing deal. 135 specific prophecies prophecies about kings from the north and kings from the south and, you know, the king of Ptolemy and the Seleucus dynasty and the Greeks and the Persians. It's, it's incredible. So here we go. Our first heading, verses one through four, from the Persian empire to the death of Alexander. Let's read verse one. As for me, this is Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 11. As for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him And keep in mind that verse one is pointing us back to the last chapter. Really, there shouldn't be a chapter division here. If you read through 10, it just flows right into chapter 11. The angel is actually still speaking to Daniel that appeared to him. And at this point in Daniel's life, the Babylonians have been overthrown by the Medes and Persians. You remember that Daniel was a teenager in Jerusalem, in Israel, when they were conquered by the Babylonians, led away into captivity. That's where Daniel rises to prominence in the courts of the king, Nebuchadnezzar initially, and then through the succession of the Babylonian kings until the Medes and Persians take over. They conquer. There's there's a transition of power. And that's the point where we find Daniel now at this point. And in verse 21, or excuse me, back from verse 21 of chapter 10, you remember that there's this scene and we're picking up the story. So try to remember from last week, these angels that are fighting the demonic influences in the region. The one angel, do you remember this? Has to call for assistance from Michael, the prince of the angels. And and we might wonder, why is this warfare going on? And the simple answer is because the restoration of Israel back to their land preserves the people of God and it prepares the way for the son of God to come as Messiah. See, there were already prophecies that were given that Messiah would come. And so when the people are in captivity, it seems as though the plan has failed, but God is faithful And so there's this spiritual battle, angels and demons, principalities and powers. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The veil is lifted and Daniel's allowed to see, whoa, there is warfare going on right now around the people of God going back to their land, which prepares the way for Jesus, the savior to come. There's this demonic determination to not let this happen. A cool little connection for you people that get excited about history. Uh, And in the Bible, 
is that 55 years after this point in Daniel 11, there's a king named Ahasuerus, also named Xerxes, who is almost convinced by a man named Haman to completely exterminate the Jews. Does that sound familiar to anybody? The story of who? Esther. God uses Esther for such a time as this to save his people from being destroyed because God's plan is being worked out. The second major attempt in history to exterminate the Jewish people after Haman's sinister plot was from a character that we've heard about already, we'll hear more about today, Antiochus Epiphanes has this plan to abolish the Jewish faith. So so here's the point where we're at in the story. Verse two, now I will show you the truth, the angel says to Daniel. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he will stir up, all against the kingdom of Greece. So again, Persians are in power. The angel says to Daniel, three more Persian kings are coming one after another and the fourth will be richer than the rest and stir up the whole kingdom against Greece, which if you read history is exactly what happened. Three kings, then the king named Xerxes comes. He was determined to destroy destroy Greece. So he spent four years raising an army of 2.5 million men. This is real, real history. He had vast wealth with which to raise up this army. And this army, when they went to war, you can read about it. It took them seven days to march across a line of boats in the Aegean Sea to get to Greece. And when they got there, one of the bloodiest, if not the bloodiest battle in all of history took place. Technically, the Greeks lost, but Xerxes' army was decimated, 2.5 million men, the the army virtually destroyed. And so for the next 150 years, just like the angel tells Daniel, the Greeks are waiting for their opportunity to take revenge. We keep reading, verse 3, then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he's arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, not to his children, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides thee. So 150 years after that bloody battle, Alexander the Great does arise, he conquers the world at a young age, but he dies shortly after. Even as it says, he's broken off. We've seen prophecies about him before. And what's really interesting to me is that's, that's all we really hear about it. The Bible doesn't really necessarily focus on the people who've made history. It's like just this short description of Alexander the Great. And we might think, well, that's it. Why why so little to say about him? And the reason is because you have to remember, Daniel is in communication with God. These heavenly beings are revealing the revelation of God. And it's all about who? Israel. These things are focused on the story, the plot. It's focused on God's people. So other people that make history, Bible not so interested in that because God's plan, God's story is what the scriptures are revealing and focusing on. And so from this point on, and we're, these are gonna be some of the verses that we skip. You can read them on your own time. But we're going to primarily read, because if you remember from previous studies, Alexander the Great, just like it says here, his kingdom was divided into four parts to four of his generals, not his offspring. And we're going to primarily read here in Daniel 11 about the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. The Seleucids, when you, when you think of them, one of Alexander's general, one of the lineages of kings in Greece, they were in Syria which is why they're called the king of the north because everything is in relationship to what? Israel. So north of Israel is Syria. That's why it's the king of the north. The king of the south, south of Israel is 
Egypt, that's the Ptolemy. So when you think king of the south, think Egypt, Ptolemy. When you think king of the north, think Syria, Seleucids. Everything is focused on and oriented around God's plan for his people because Israel scrunched between these two kingdoms and everything these kingdoms are doing as they war with one another, which is what follows here in Daniel 11 is the description of all of their wars and treacheries and plots and you know, betrayals, all of these things that are spelled out here in, in incredible detail. History actually bears out. You can read about it. It's, it's fascinating. But just remember, everything's focused on Israel, God's people. So if you're outlining this, if you want to try to understand it, verse 5 through 20 is a description of this series of wars between the Ptolemies, the king of the south, good, and the Seleucids, the king of the north, good, Syria in the north, Egypt in the south. So then we come to verse 21 through 35, and the heading here is the great persecution of Antiochus Epiphanes. We talked about this already in Daniel 8, because in Daniel 8, we were, we were introduced to the sinister little horn of Daniel 8. Anybody remember any of that? If not, I don't blame you, but you could go back, listen. If you take notes, revisit. It's good to refresh. Somewhere around the year 175, this man, a real ruler in history, appears in the Greek empire to claim the rule of Syria. And as he does, he also claims rule over Israel. And when Antiochus, there is a series of Antiochus, they share this name in the, in the dynasty, so to speak. But this particular one, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, he considers himself the manifestation of God in the flesh. And every coin that he mints in his empire speaks to this. And, and um, he had this like God complex. He, he demanded in many ways to be worshiped. So he overthrows the priesthood in Israel. He puts in place and installs his own puppet priesthood. And he renews as the king of the north, right? He renews the rivalry with Egypt, initially using treachery by convincing some of the servants of Ptolemy, the king of the south, Egypt, to betray their king. And so through this, they come to the peace table and make agreements, but verse 27 indicates they're all lying to each other. They're having peace talks, but nobody's telling the truth. He then attempts another military venture into Egypt, but the the history is fascinating because the Romans actually intervene And literally, the history story goes, they draw a line in the sand and they say to Antiochus, if you cross this line, you die. You can't come any further. One of the stories is that a a particular Roman general drew, he had a stick in his hand, he drew a circle around him and said, you come any closer to Egypt, you're done. And so Antiochus, this mad, power-hungry ruler, who's turned away from his plans to conquer the south in Egypt. In his frustration, he turns north. And what's between Egypt and Syria? Israel, good. And he vents all of his anger on the Jewish people. When he arrives in Israel, 40,000 Jews are instantly put to death. 40,000. By the time he's done venting his rage, 100,000, over 100,000 Jewish people are slaughtered. He goes into the temple in Jerusalem. He slaughters a pig on the altar of Yahweh. He smears the blood of the pig on the walls of the temple, and he forces the priests that are there to drink the remaining blood from the pig. If you don't Remember or connect to that, pigs are unclean animals. This would have been a violation, a desecration of everything that the Jewish people believed in. And then he puts a statue of Zeus in the temple of Yahweh and he makes the worship of the God of Israel punishable by death. And so the Jews are now threatened. If anyone circumcises their sons, death. If anyone offers a sacrifice to anyone other than Antiochus Epiphanes or his god Zeus, death. 
If anyone's found with a Torah scroll, death. And so the, the, the threat and the, the terror of this time for God's people, it can't really be measured by our modern suburban living safe minds, right? We, we don't comprehend this kind of life. But let's read a little bit of what happens in verse 32. He, that's who we're talking about, this ruler Antiochus, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Some will be sucked into this either because they're deceived. Apparently Antiochus Epiphanes was a great orator and could convince people through his speeches. Some, some will be deceived, some probably just yielding to the pressure of not wanting to die, give in. But it says, the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by the sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. And when they stumble, they shall receive a little help. Many shall join themselves with flattery and some of the wise will stumble. And so they may be refined, purified, made white until the time of the end for it. It still awaits the appointed time. And so, if you know about history, this is the period of the Maccabean revolts, the, the Jewish family that stands up to Antiochus. It's an incredible period in history to read about, but it's also a difficult and dark time for God's people. Well, something significant happens now in verse 35 because verse two through 34 in Daniel 11 chronicles 470 consecutive years of Jewish history. Again, we didn't read it all, but if you read through it and you get a good commentary and you follow the history, you're, I'm telling you, your mind will be blown. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. But this is 470 years of Jewish history, but then verse 35 suddenly leaps over centuries and takes us to the time of the end. Did you notice that? Verse 35 points us to the time of the end for there's something that awaits for the appointed time. What's going on? Can we review for one second Daniel 9? Some of you are like, no, no, please. Don't take us back there. Just, just stay with me. Daniel 9, do you remember the 70 weeks? Okay, just let me read it to you real quick. It's on the screen. 70 weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed once a prince, thus shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks where the city is built up again with squares and moat, but in troubled time. After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. Who's that? Jesus, right? The anointed one who was cut off, who has nothing as he hangs naked on the cross for our sin that we might be brought back to God. And so the people of the prince who's to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's AD 70. And its end shall come with a flood and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So when we looked at the 70s, who put it? Put that graphic up, Ethan. Here's a timeline to help you make sense of all that. That first little blue arrow on the left of the timeline, the first seven weeks, 49 years. Remember we talked about a week in Hebrew is not necessarily what we think of it. It's, it's a group of seven. What makes sense of Daniel 9 is years and the timeline fits together with history in the most incredible way. Those first seven years described in Daniel 9, 457 to 408 BC, from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, that's the first seven weeks. Then, 
immediately the next 62 weeks again where the, the city's built up, the moat and, and the streets are there, but it's enduring these troubled times, right? Because who shows up in that 62-week period? Antiochus Epiphanes, the person we're talking about right now in Daniel 11. And so there's the next 434 years, 62 weeks plus seven weeks, 69 weeks. Where's the 70th week? Remember, there's a gap. Because when Christ, the anointed one, comes after the 62 weeks, what begins is the church age where essentially God puts Israel on hold. They're still on the line, but he puts them on hold and he begins to work through the church. And the invitation for salvation is through the church. And there's no longer a division between Jew and Gentile, but all are welcomed into God's saving plan through the gospel and through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're in this period now, the, the, the church age, how long does it go? Till he comes. Which could be any moment, could be any day. Who knows? We're expecting we're living in that expectation that Jesus will come. But, but remember, first 70 weeks rebuilding, next 62 weeks, the city's there, but in troubled times after 62 weeks, Messiah's cut off. There's one week left where the church is raptured, which kicks off the final seven-year period that Jesus called the Great Tribulation. That's the final 70th week. Because remember, Daniel 9, 70 weeks are determined for Israel. Those 70 weeks that were revealed to Daniel had to do with his people, God's plan for Israel. 69 weeks fulfilled once Christ comes the first time. One week remaining leading up to when he comes again. Are you with me? Awesome. At least four of you are. Three of you are nodding like in a dazed, like I think I'm with you and one of you said yes. Great. So this is what we're reading about all the way through verse 35 when something happens. And suddenly let's, let's read from here. Verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. And the king shall do as he wills. Um, he will speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He'll prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall pay no attention to any other God for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these, a God whom his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God and those those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for price. This description cannot and does not fit with the figure we've been looking at, Antiochus Epiphanes. The things that are described here, those that can see the perfect fulfillment of what the angel is declaring to Daniel in history, they say at this point it breaks off. There's a significant shift because nothing that's described in the verses that we read fits with the life of Antiochus, which points to the reality of the one who's coming, the man of lawlessness, the beast of revelation, the antichrist he's called in the New Testament. These are the names of the one that will be revealed in that final 70th week, that last seven year period. One will come who, remember, remember from our study, Antiochus Epiphanes was the prototype. It was like the dress rehearsal for, for an even greater deception, an e even greater persecution at the end in this time of great tribulation. And so what happens in Daniel 11 is you're going along just like the previous chapters, essentially through the first 69 weeks. And then he just jumps over the gap because he's concerned with 
the people of Israel. 70 weeks are determined for Israel. God, what is your plan for your people, Israel? And God's graciously laying out that plan to Daniel. So he just skips over the church age. That has its own whole testament to read about. But Daniel, there is one coming, the Antichrist, in the end, who will make Antiochus Epiphanes, both his deception and his destruction, pale in comparison to the time of great tribulation. So finally, the last five verses are the description of the triumph and fall of this antichrist figure who has yet to come. Keep in mind, this is an actual world leader, just like Alexander the Great, just like all these people in history that will somehow rally the world in great deception to thinking that he has the answer to the world's problems only to deceive and eventually demand that he be worshiped, exalt himself above God and persecute everyone who would worship any other God. What happens to him? Verse 40, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships. And he'll come into countries and overflow and pass through and come into the glorious land, that's Israel. And tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab in the part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries. The land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become the ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and precious things of Egypt. The Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him. And he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. He shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. And yet... He shall come to his end with none to help him. These are the words of the Lord. Ultimately, it's revealed to Daniel that the Antichrist will meet his end. And it's fascinating to me as looming of a figure and character as this is, that he's simply dismissed from history with six Hebrew words. He shall come to his end with none to help him. When God arises in that day to come and to judge and to establish his kingdom forever, none, including this terrifying figure, will stand. He will simply be flicked off the pages of history into the lake of fire. When I read Daniel 11, and I think of history, God's plan, prophecy, the future, how even parts of this chapter are still in front of us. And we read those final verse, five verses that we just did and think, what could that mean? What will that look like? When will that be? I think of what Jesus said in Matthew 6, which of you being anxious can add a single hour to your span of life? Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We can't even predict what will happen tomorrow, can we? We have no idea. And yet here God is just laying out hundreds and hundreds of years, really the timeline in some ways for the rest of history for Daniel to see how powerful is God. And here we're reminded that God has a plan and a purpose. And so why is he laying it out for Daniel like this? Because through Daniel, he's going to prepare his people. If God was going to come right away, you don't need to be prepared. But if God is calling his people to endure until he comes, he wants in a way graciously to say, I want to show you what's up ahead so you have a little bit 
of an idea of what to expect. It's extremely helpful to know what you're in for when you're called to endure, isn't it? Isn't it helpful if someone says, hey, we're gonna go over there and you go, okay, we're gonna walk there. How far is it? Isn't it helpful if they say 20 miles versus 10 blocks? Is it helpful? Yeah. Is it helpful to know where you are and what the weather's gonna be like? And is it hilly? Is it, you know, are there sidewalks? Are we walking on the freeway? What's going on? It's helpful to know so that you can endure what's up ahead. But the question for us, I think, would be this. How does what God did for Daniel help us to hold on to hope? Because that's what it means to endure, to hold on to our hope as the people of God as we sojourn through this world. And in the midst of all of the chaos and confusion, it helps to know that there is a plan. That's the first thing I want to remind you of as we start to close. God has a plan. How do we apply Daniel 11 to our lives? God has a plan. If you don't understand anything else, any of the history, the dates, the players, the names, who's in the north again, who's in the south, God has a plan. That's what this is speaking to us. Any planners in the room? Who's a planner? I should not have my hand up. I am not a planner. I am an in the moment kind of guy. Go with the flow. My wife is a planner. And I I thank God for planners. I thank God for my wife. I'm more of an idea guy, but I I just was thinking about this history. I'm like, huh, an idea is not a plan. It's just an idea. (laughs) If you have ideas, if they're any good, you need a plan to go with your idea. So I thank God for the planners in my life and I'm surrounded by them on staff in my house. I think God knows you need a lot of help. So you have a lot of bad ideas and you need to get some good plans going. When you're in a moment, if you're an in the moment kind of person, this is how I relate to it. When you're in in a moment, go with the flow and suddenly things are not going well, you know what you need? A plan. <laughs> you need a plan. And so... If you're in a moment today in life, I want to invite you to look to God. He has a plan. That's the message of Daniel 11. God has a plan. Well, what is it, Lord? Most of the time, most of the time, listen, he won't show us in this kind of detail why we couldn't handle it. I promise you, if God, if you just look back on the last 15 years of your life and say, if God showed me all the parts of that beforehand, would I have continued on? Probably not. I probably would have exited out in some way or ran away like Jonah. Think of this in Daniel 10, when God started to reveal the plan to Daniel, what did he do? He passed out. He got sick. He couldn't breathe. He was overwhelmed. God has a plan. And so whatever moment you're in, trust that God has a plan. The second thing I want to encourage you from this chapter, God made the plan. (laughs) You might think, well, how's that different from the first point? I just want to remind you, not only does God have a plan, he's the one who made it, which means he's in complete control and he's a genius. He has infinite wisdom and knowledge. I remember when we were building out this church from an office building and we had an architect draw us plans. It was like pages and pages of plans. And I had the plans. They were in my office most of the time in a box, but I had the plan. I had no idea what to do with it. And even if I had an idea what to do with it, I, I didn't have what it took to make it happen. It's a simple point. It's a simple encouragement, but please Remember, not only that God has a plan, he made the plan. He has the ability to accomplish his purpose and all that he's planned. And that's my third encouragement. God has a purpose. Not just a plan that he made, 
But if every idea needs a plan, every plan needs a point. And so if someone comes to you and says, here's the plan, and you go, great, that makes sense, but what's the point? Doesn't it matter? Whether you want to get involved in that plan, whether you want to participate in that plan or not, we need to be constantly reminded in what we go through in life, that God is doing something greater than we can imagine. He has a purpose. There is a point. And so my final encouragement is just to invite us to put all our hope in him. The same God who came up with this plan and revealed it to Daniel and accomplished it perfectly so that nothing in history could stop it from coming to pass. Listen, this is our God. And I heard someone say recently, you don't lose hope. You ever heard that phrase? Don't lose hope. You don't lose hope, you let go of it. Hope is something you hold on to with everything you have until you decide this isn't helping me anymore. This isn't worth it anymore. And it's in our disappointment that we find where our confidence really is. The plan that God was revealing to Daniel was not full of sunshines, rainbows, and unicorns. It was full of wars and conflict and conquering, and pain, and suffering. And God says, Daniel, I'm showing you the plan so that you can prepare my people to remind them that I'm in control and to remember that there's a purpose. There's something that I'm accomplishing that you can't imagine. And so while we don't want to settle, we need to settle in for the long haul church. We need to settle in and hold on to our hope. I think that's the greatest temptation for us. I think the greatest temptation for the people of God is to settle to let go of the hope that we have and say, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm just gonna get what I can out of now, here. Say, God, I, I don't, I'm not interested in your plan anymore. I'm gonna go with mine. But what I love about God is he is here. He meets us in our disappointment and discouragement and the difficult times in life. And he says, church, he says, all I need is a yes. All I need is a yes. It can be the weakest yes in the world. Sometimes I think heaven's watching with this great cloud of witnesses and we kind of like, you know, squeak out a half-hearted yes and they go, we got it, let's go. They said yes. I remember when I was 16, the times of worship in church when God was getting a hold of my heart and just pouring out my heart with songs like, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Jesus, have your way in me. I was 16, I had no idea what that meant or what life had in store, but I, I think heaven was like, he said, yes, let's go. Do you remember the songs you sang? Do you remember the prayers you prayed? Do you remember the times you've offered your heart to the Lord and said, yes? Sometimes I think people wonder in what you go through in life, I don't know if I can trust God, Zach, anymore. I don't know if I can believe that a good God would allow this to happen in my life. Maybe you're struggling to believe today. Can I ask you something? Do you hope that it's true? 
Do you hope that God is here? Do you hope that he really loves you and has a plan for your life? Because if you at least hope that it's true, hold on to that hope until he gives you the faith because the Bible says faith is a gift from God. So hold on to your hope. Don't let go of your hope and ask God to give you faith as he works out his plan in your life. Let's pray. I wanna invite you just to put your hand on your heart this morning. Because the Bible says, speaking of hope, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I don't know what kind of disappointment you might be carrying, discouragement, depression, anxiety, fear. But I know that the God of hope wants to meet you in this moment and that he's here. And if you're struggling to believe that, I simply want to invite you to just hold on to that hope and ask the Lord to come with faith with what you need in this moment as he works out his plan in your life. Let's worship him. All right, well, thanks again for listening to God's word with us. And we always wanna encourage you to respond, to not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. So was there something in the teaching that God was stirring in your heart, something that you can act on, step out in faith and do? Maybe take some time to reflect on that, pray on that, and then do what God is leading you to do because I believe you're gonna see him do great things in your life. So thanks again, God bless you.